everyone. Uh, the panel that we're doing right now is called How Scaling Impacts Privacy. I apologize, my voice is a little rough today, but I think I can manage. Um, my name is Liz Steininger. I work at the Civility, um, but I'm just here to moderate the panel. And we have four wonderful panelists um, to talk about this topic today. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And then we'll also, and then we'll get started. Uh, hi everyone, I'm uh, Josh Cincinnati. I'm the Executive Director of the Zcash Foundation, a US-based uh, 501c3 nonprofit focused on uh, privacy and uh, financial transactions online primarily through, uh, through Zcash. Um, so I'm very excited to talk about all this today. Uh, Liz previously said that we could have our little rant about privacy as part of this introduction, so I'm going to... Yeah, and we, can, we can add that to the introduction. <laughs> so yeah, why does scaling... Um, how do you think scaling impacts privacy? Why do you think it matters that we're having this discussion? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, um, I, I, I think something that's become apparently, like, very apparent um, is that uh, oftentimes uh, the discussion around uh, privacy is, is at odds with uh, what we can do uh, or the, the things that uh, can enable scalability and you have to sacrifice uh, one in order to uh, have the other. Um, the other. The other thing that I'm like really fundamentally concerned about is actually more about scaling, and this is kind of semi off topic, but scaling the public discussion around um, why privacy is important because if, if we don't really like socially agree that it is, uh, we're going to have a very hard time actually convincing people to integrate the things necessary to make those sorts of trade-offs. So, anyway. Hi, I'm Ed Felton. I am co-founder and chief scientist at Offchain Labs. I'm a professor at Princeton and sometime U.S. government official. Um, so, we might come back to that later. Um, so, for me, the one of the big issues of, about scaling and privacy is what happens as we try to uh, meet this vision of Web3, of scaling up this technology to the point where it's something that everybody uses all the time. Uh, and I think there's a lot we can learn from the history of privacy on Web1 and Web2, uh, which were not good. People are very unhappy with how that worked out. And it's not because there was not useful privacy technology there. We knew how to do end-to-end -end encryption. We knew how to encrypt in place. We knew how to do strong authentication. We knew how to do a lot of things that uh, somehow did not actually get done in practice with our data. Um, we have horrible problems with endpoint security. We have horrible problems with all of our data sitting in corporate servers where who knows what happens to it. The point being that having the technological tools there is not enough. If we just redo everything that happened in Web 1 and Web 2, but now with more stuff on a public ledger, we're going to get a result that is no better. Uh, and so we have to think beyond just building the technological tools. We have to understand how to build a market and how to build a structure and a community that's going to behave differently than others have before when the big money shows up. Hi, so my name is Ian Myers. One of the founding scientists of Zcash, and as of next fall, professor at the University of Maryland. Um, first got into cryptocurrency because I was worried about the privacy aspects of it, because cryptocurrency is basically Twitter for your bank account. And everything's public. Everybody, and that's not acceptable for the same reasons that I just said. That's also inexorably linked, I think, to the scaling problem. Like, a lot of people think that privacy techniques are opposed to scaling. They make scaling hard, but things like ZK snarks are slow. But when it comes to verifying data on the blockchain, it actually makes things faster. Because uh, Twitter for your bank account also describes the scaling problem uh, somewhat aptly, and that Twitter had these hilarious problems when they first started, because they were trying to broadcast huge amounts of data to everybody. And so if you solve the privacy problem by removing that data, and they can't quote verify, you've also inherently solved the scaling problem. So I think these two things are linked. They're actually a thing where you can have synergies between them. Um, my name is Jacob Eberhardt. Um, I'm a researcher at Technical University of Berlin. And um, so why I'm here is I work on different things in the context of off-chaining. And one of these um, things was the Socrates framework, which is kind of programming language and toolbox that allows you to 
easily or more easily specify uh, programs that are provable in CK snarks and verify them conveniently on the blockchain. What's maybe interesting to note here is, like Ian indicated, CK snarks and these things that are not often categorized as privacy tech, um, where like privacy was not a motivation to do that. It was actually scaling because the idea was. If there is a way to verify a very complex computation with a constant amount of computational effort, and we can do that on the blockchain, then we can scale very well. So I do agree that these things are not opposed at all, and it, the scaling thing is what actually brought me there, and now it's also a nice tool to address privacy. Um, my take on privacy and security and how they relate is both are key challenges that need to be addressed for dApps to actually become successful and make mainstream usage because I do think people will not be comfortable, comfortable tweeting not only their financial uh, transactions over blockchains but actually all of their interaction with any IT service over the blockchain. So let's say we solve scaling in a year and privacy tech does not keep up. I don't think we will see mainstream adoption of dApps, right? So for me, it's a key enabler. Great. So thanks, every thanks, panelists, for your introductions. And we've covered a, a few different things uh, here. Well, actually, there's a lot just captured right there in those four statements. So um, let's talk about how things are working now and why we should why we should care. Let's dig into that a little bit more. Um, so right now, uh, sometimes projects will think in the space that it's more important to solve some technical problems to solve like you know use case problem, and we'll layer privacy on top later, um, or that yeah that let's get the scale in first, and then we'll do the privacy part because you know there's not that much we shouldn't be too worried about. That. So let's talk a little bit about um, maybe what is um, what is the concern right now with um, the technology that's being used and uh, how is it not good for privacy now and how this could scale up and to be something native in the future. Uh, yeah. Sure, I'm, I will start. Um, so, I mean, the way it works now for anyone that, I mean, it's everyone that uses Ethereum in, in the room, uh, or, or many other cryptocurrencies, frankly, actually, the average Zcash user, the way they use it now, um, is that uh, they use the portion of the system that effectively paints the transaction graph for anybody to see. And uh, it only takes, like, one short conversation with a blockchain analytics firm to realize that the system as it exists today it, within all of these projects is measurably worse than the patchwork of offline cash transactions and various financial intermediaries that actually do have some degree of, of privacy guarantees um, uh, in the way, the way it works today. So I, I think like we can all kind of universally agree that like these systems need to, need to change uh, in order for us to uh, actually feel comfortable using them uh, and on a more day-to-day -day and, and broader basis because otherwise what's going to wind up happening is we're going to recreate this brand new financial system but then people won't actually feel comfortable using dApps uh, because they'll know that all the data can be uh, traced and open for uh, their competitors to, to see. Uh, people won't actually engage in, in any cryptocurrency transactions because they know that uh, companies and uh, Governments will be surveilling their every move, uh, and that's like a very frightening thought. So, I, like, how do we fix that? Uh, I'll leave it to smarter people than me to figure that out. But uh, I mean, one one of the ways to do it is to figure out how do we how do we incentivize privacy uh, on these chains, right? How do we get people to actually say that there's it's cheaper uh, to to do this on on, on various chains, uh, and then socially, how do we connect? The, or really solve the disconnect that people have. Uh, like right, right now, we, we've talked about this before, uh, uh, Liz, but like when, when people interact and buy something online with their credit card or use, use cryptocurrency without any privacy protection, they don't, they don't really think about how many people can actually surveil and understand the, the data that is being uh, sold on their behalf or observed on their behalf. Like if you imagine going into a store using cash like buy a newspaper, um, the online equivalent, there'd be like 30 people in the room watching you do that and then taking notes 
and then recommending other newspapers for you to buy while you're, you're in the process of doing that. And most people don't view it that way. So I think we have a big social challenge in terms of convincing people that that, that is the truth. I, I want to just sort of take issue with the approach of, which you talked about, but obviously weren't suggesting, um, uh, that we'll just build the thing first and then we will figure out how to add privacy later. Um, because if you say that, what you're essentially saying is, we're going to design a system in a particular way, and once we've invested a lot of engineering effort and we have a big installed base, then we're going to fundamentally redesign it. Um, that's not going to work. Um, if you don't start out with privacy in mind, if you don't start out at least thinking about what your privacy strategy is going to be, and at the very least not engineering in a way that's inconsistent with that strategy, you're going to find yourself locked in to um, a design later that is very difficult uh, from a privacy standpoint. And, and just to add to that, it's tempting to think that you don't need privacy if you're not doing payments. So actually, when, when Josh here wanted me to give the first answer, I think you expected me to give the standard spiel I give of, well, you can't do payments uh, that are public. It's Twitter for your bank account. You, you'll get stopped by your ex-girlfriend or boyfriend. Your business competitors will see what you're doing. Foreign governments will use it for counterintelligence. This is uh, a rant I can go on for 20 minutes. But it's tempting, and I think particularly for this audience, to go, well, if I'm not doing payments, if I'm doing crypto kitties, if I'm doing something completely different, then there's no privacy problem because you just can't think in terms of what it would be. And actually, I have that problem too when I think about smart contracts. But it's not the case, right? There will be some privacy problem if stuff succeeds. If your stuff is worth money, someone will want to know what the data is. And I think you had a very good point when we were planning this panel kind of way, that for actual contracts, right, you don't leap the fact that there's a business relationship between two different parties every time you sign one of these, right? But in a blockchain, when you establish that kind of relationship, it's public to everybody. And that's just not a thing companies or enterprises are going to do. And so this goes back to your point that if we don't solve these privacy problems, even for things that aren't like money, it's going to be a major barrier to adoption. I think you made a very good point that privacy needs to be considered early in the process of designing applications and also platforms. But in like my perspective is that currently people are also ill-equipped to address these privacy concerns from a technological perspective. Right? We built Ethereum as a platform that allows you to do something you could, some people say, also do in Bitcoin to a large degree, but it was super complex. So Ethereum came along, had this nice programming model and smart contracts that added generality to the field. The problem is now, um, Zcash solved it for Bitcoin, but who solves the same issue for Ethereum? Ethereum is much more generic and there will, be no, uh, there will not be a privacy solution a uh, technical solution that fits all the use cases that can be built on the platform. So from my perspective, it's key that we establish good tooling and equip the engineers that build decentralized applications with the tools they need to make their stuff privacy aware. And I'm not only talking about cryptographic mechanisms, or, but, but I think they could bring you a long way, but as a community, we need to think about how we enable people to build privacy-aware applications, because now, even if people think about it, I think they can often just not pull it off. And not everybody has a Zcash engineering team. Well, one more sort of engineering note here, and that is privacy is a safety property, and a safety property can be lost at any layer in the system. So you can have the strongest possible platform underneath you that's privacy-preserving, but you can still build an application on top of that that destroys privacy in the same way that the fact that you have HTTPS to transmit data across the internet is an excellent way to protect the privacy of that data. But there are plenty of, uh, of services that use HTTPS and yet have terrible privacy. Because of the application level, they give away everything that you gain at the lower level. <coughs> So, um, so, so one thing that uh, you were saying is that uh, looking to the future, uh, we want to try to avoid the mistakes that we made with Web 1 and Web 2 and do Web 3 different. And so the answer is privacy by design, good privacy tooling, things like that, giving developers the opportunity and the knowledge to build in privacy by design and make it easy for them. So do we think that that would just, is that it? Is that the answer? That's how we get Web 3? Um, will, we, will that really help our scaling issue and not have one 
happen to again? Well, I, I think if all of the engineers in the world could make a pact that we would only build um, privacy-friendly technologies for the rest of our lives uh, and be careful about who else we train to be an engineer, then we'd be in good shape. But given the incentive structure that we're in, given how everything works, we have to be concerned about what kind of market develops and avoiding a situation where there's a race to the bottom. Um, and that means we need to think about how about governance because there is a competitive dynamic that will drive everyone to try to collect and exploit more data than the other person in order to eke out a little bit more profit, gain a little bit of a business advantage. Uh, I don't think we can solve this by just all agreeing to not be evil. Um, and I don't think we can solve it by trying to build um, a layer one or a layer two, which is going to uh, make, um, uh, make insecure or unprivate uh, applications on top of them impossible. We need to have some way of governing our behavior that is stronger than just, uh, than just slogans. Uh, and that means that we need to think about how we're going to operate. We need to think about rules of the road for the sector. And we can try to set those ourselves. Uh, governments will try to set them for us. Sometimes governments will actually be helping us when they do that. Um, but they're going to have to be rules because uh, the, the market by itself leads to a bad outcome when it comes to privacy. Sort of. Oh, I, oh, okay. No, I just wanted to add to that that I see the decentralized space also as a kind of opportunity because it just shows everybody where which data is collected and that it needs protection, whereas in the current system it's kind of hidden behind API or company walls and we do not really know because we cannot personally track what's happening behind that so like it by making this issue a very prominent issue by showing everybody hey your data is there in clear text it will probably encourage this process to speed it up hopefully and, and one sort of follow-up question I had um, for you Ed, on the idea of how governments could potentially provide um, you know, guidance or, or additional incentive for us to consider privacy um, as, a, as a sort of central tenant in all these systems. Do you think like uh, things like GDPR um, that kind of transform user data into a much bigger liability for, for companies and business entities, do you think actions like that in other governments or, or regulations like that in other governments might serve to compel people to uh, effectively change their behavior when it comes to businesses approaching these systems? I mean, I think ultimately uh, when businesses think of large holdings of data as a source of risk, then their, uh, then their, uh, their calculations will change. Um, GDPR is one of the things that does that. It's legal risk, it's reputational risk, and other kinds of risk that can come from holding data. Governments will be tightening the screws because there's a perception, probably correct, that uh, privacy has gotten worse over time and companies have become more careless with consumer data's data over time. And if this sector is going to be better, something's going to have to happen to make that happen. Um, the, uh, anybody in this sector or any other sector who gets big enough to matter, um, gets big enough that your investors are happy, um, you will be visible to uh, to policymakers and regulators, and if you are not behaving well, um, you're, you're going to find out. Uh, in the same way that ICO markets have seen crackdowns, uh, we're going to see, I think, crackdowns on privacy if people are really careless. So I guess my question for everybody is, uh, how do we make sure we get privacy that's actually good and not just the illusion of, of compliance, right? We've seen this in for payments and Bitcoin and Ethereum and such. We have these privacy techniques that like look like they work now, um, but they really don't. And so to anyone who just has a public data set, you can think you're safe, but then when you start looking at sophisticated analysis or people have access to data that's also not public, then this stuff all breaks down. And it seems like the, the knee-jerk reaction we're going to get in anticipation of GDPR and everything else is someone does some completely broken piece of cryptography that's like good enough to get past compliance until five years later when we find out it doesn't actually work. Yeah, um, so I want to speak to this one because I was at one point the CTO at the Federal Trade Commission, which is the 
uh, U.S. government agency that is most responsible for enforcing privacy laws. And one of the things in that world that drove me absolutely crazy was when companies made blatantly technically false statements about uh, privacy protection. For example, claiming that we only store the hash of the 32-bit IP address, therefore we have no way to know what the IP address is. Or even people who claim we have the hash of a 10-digit phone number and therefore um, we have no way of knowing what it is, and saying that with a straight face to senior policymakers. Um, and so uh, I think over time governments can get smarter. They're hiring people who know how to call BS on those things. Um, I mean, that's part of it, right? Part of it is we have to create an environment where people just can't get away with bogus arguments about privacy, right? And we need to call them out. Uh, if somebody's making a bogus privacy argument, they should be called out by their peers publicly, uh, and it should affect their reputation. Governments will listen to that stuff, but most impo but more importantly, prospective employers, prospective investors, and so on, will listen as well. It's sort of up to us to call BS on each other when somebody is saying something that uh, is really misleading to their customers. So besides um, the good nature of developers in the community, saying that they're not going to collect personal data and they care about privacy. Um, also, uh, government regulations um, and uh, these, uh, yeah, and also just uh, catching each other on BS on, on each other. What else can we do to incentivize um, privacy being baked into our systems and allowing them to scale? I guess this will go back to my previous point a little bit, but you really have to make so you have to make your users want it. Like I, I honestly think that if you so there there are all these external incentives and, and and but one thing that people should be intrinsically motivated about at least you know as an as an, an American coming from this sort of constitutional rights perspective, like uh, you should care about your Fourth Amendment rights, care about the sort of right to fundamental privacy that is enshrined by these fundamental legal rights. Um, yeah, but I do agree that oftentimes, like in practice, I think the user has really bad trade-offs. There is one service that is very nice and easy to use. It doesn't care about privacy. And then you can do a Zcash shield transaction, which is very complex in comparison to PayPal, right? So. I think it's, maybe that's not the best example, but it's also like just clicking accept on a website for something. So we need to provide better trade-offs and maybe regulatorily force people to provide better trade-offs. I think we also need to provide better attacks, right? Like it would be really good if you can demonstrate to people what's wrong. So a good example of this is uh, Venmo, which in the US is an app used to pay back your friends for dinner because we don't have a good banking system for transferring money that way. Um, and. Uh, for a long time, a bunch of people knew that Venmo had this default public uh, feature where it literally was Twitter for your bank account. It was a web page you go to that listed everything everyone did. But we were all shouting into the wind. And then someone made an art project where they had this website with all this stuff on it and a narrative. And all of a sudden, people started caring about this. And so similarly for blockchains, I think we actually need to have people writing tools with nice UIs and look, here's all the data we can find out about you. Don't you really wish you hadn't made this mistake, right? And until we do that, it's just a hypothetical. Of, oh, I can tell you that Monero doesn't work well. I can tell you that this doesn't work well. That doesn't work well. But it's not real. I mean, another thing we can do is give users some hope. I think most users, most of the time, when they use technology, just have this fatalistic attitude: whatever I do, my data is going to go everywhere. Right? And so it doesn't really matter what I choose. People don't really believe that if they choose product A rather than product B, they'll be in a, they'll be in a significantly better position with respect to privacy. Um, and in that kind of environment, if there is a product, a stack, if there is some environment that's available to people that actually does offer better privacy, um, and we, uh, we uh, talk about the idea that it is possible to do this, um, because it, I think in the, uh, in the legacy tech space, the narrative that you hear is that, you know, we really don't want to have all your data, but we just need it to run our business. It's just a thing that's necessary to make the sector go. Um, and um, I don't think that's necessarily true, but to the extent that this is the way that our community talks about these things, uh, we will make it true. 
Um, so we need to work hard, I think, to try to give users hope and to try to talk about holding ourselves to a higher standard that we can solve these problems and we don't have to just collect everything in order to make our businesses go. Does, does that get, get easier in Web3 when we're not talking about do you trust Google with your data or Facebook with your data, but it's actually do you trust some part of your data or is it public to everybody? Is the fact that it's not just this trade-off maybe give us some better ability to look and say, look, you really don't want this exposed to everybody. You can at least decide you only trust whatever it is you're using. Does that change the narrative at all, you think? Or? Like, or I maybe have a follow-up question. Do you think there's really that much of a choice you have in Web3, or isn't it rather there is an implementation that gives you privacy properties technically where you have zero? For me, it's much more binary in that space because no longer a company that has data and can act um, maliciously or be yeah be good with the data. Uh, well, in the in the legacy tech space, the um, uh, a lot of the privacy uh, action or trouble happens at higher levels in the stack, um, right? So, um, uh, and I think that is a real risk here in this space as well, um, that at higher levels of the stack, you might see more data collection. Um, you know, from a fundamental technology standpoint, Ian, in answer to your question, I think there are pros and cons of this with respect, um, compared to what came before. Uh, also, this is a do-over on some of the structures and approaches that happened before, uh, and maybe we're a little bit wiser about how to do it. So speaking of being wiser, let's talk a little bit about the technology and hope, actually, speaking of hope. Let's talk a little bit um, more about the technology and incentives that can be combined, perhaps. Like we were talking earlier about scalability and privacy can be done at the same time with certain technology too. I think it's good to explore that kind of thing too because it, it adds an extra opportunity for incentive that perhaps is not there in, in what, you know, what to and stuff. Um, so yeah. Do, do you want to talk about some of the abilities that we can do with uh, <laughs> the things that we can, the capabilities that we have when we're doing scaling and privacy together? So uh, my usual thing at work with is zero knowledge proofs, and we've seen a, a massive amount of new excitement of, of what we can do, and it's quite interesting. But I think we sort of people are getting distracted by looking at just the, the new exciting little pieces of it, and not the like general pattern of. Here's the tools, here's the techniques. So a common thing people think of is, we got this new piece of cryptography, we have to invent a bunch of new things to do this. This is the existing techniques for doing like how Zcash works and Merkle trees and proofs of web works well. And then also that like people in this audience get hung up on like, oh, we're in the account bottle. Bitcoin's in the UTXO bottle, and they've heard none of the techniques over there or over here. Right? And it's actually these are all pretty uniform, and you can use most of these developments on anything. So it seems like, in fact, the, the incentives that we face right now are getting very excited about what, from a privacy perspective, are actually minutiae. It's like what color paints on your car. It's not a, the, the biggest thing. There are also things that you can do in terms of design that don't rely on the absolutely newest, shiniest, most complicated cryptography. Um, so you know, looking at what we're doing at Off-Chain Labs, um, We've done a lot of work to try to move uh, state of, states of contracts off-chain. We did that originally, way back in the beginning, motivated by scalability. But when you move stuff off-chain, you when you reduce the footprint on-chain, you also have a, a significant privacy benefits. Um, so you don't need to use the highest tech stuff. There's stuff you can do within the sort of traditional engineering frameworks. And there is a synergy between efficiency and privacy in a space where uh, the public, more public on-chain setting is more expensive than what you can do privately. Uh, that's not to say that um, you should never use the, uh, the high-tech stuff or that we would never use it, but, um, but you can't get a lot without needing to uh, even use that stuff. I would totally agree and I would like to ask a question to the other panelists because it, it was like the initial question was like where did, is like how do we have privacy while we're scaling. For me, oftentimes the answer to privacy and scaling points in the same direction as these because it's like reducing blockchains to what they're actually good at and not doing as much as possible on the blockchain. And if you remove computation steps and then like to 
to verify them on chain, you can use different techniques. It can be simple integrity checks with hashes. It can be uh, complex mechanisms like snarks, starts, whatsoever. It doesn't matter. But the key aspect is we move stuff away from the blockchain, keep as much of the information of that public ledger in the first place, and then there's much less we need to bother about. And at the same time, we push with less load on the blockchain. So it's naturally going to not scale better, but for the same amount of uh, utility, uh, require less <laughs> computation to be done on chain in the first place. So, um, do you think there is a synergy between privacy and scalability or a trade off? So, I, I think I'm the lone panelist who, who said that it was a trade off. Uh, <laughs> And I was the least technical one here, so maybe I'm wrong. Um, but uh, I, I actually like I. I think there is a trade-off present in that because it creates um, it creates a degree of user complexity. Uh, for one thing, when you start offloading stuff onto other layers and doing like zk rollups and the like, like you have to figure out then how do you actually engage in that interaction layer on the user side. Uh, then the other the other thing that I, I think it creates is. Uh, you know, it does require like shinier, newer cryptography that has potentially like unknown unknowns about uh, what what you're building. Usually, with like stuff like you know Halo, uh, where there is there does seem to be like a win-win trustless setup, recursive scenario, you know, that preserves privacy. But there's so much that's unknown about it, and and you just have to understand those trade-offs when, uh, when when approaching this. That's not to say that like there isn't still some alignment on like. Yeah, there being uh, a mutual advantage to having less state on a given blockchain and more of it uh, sort of private and, and elsewhere, but it just creates new complexities that you have to deal with. Uh, to, to echo what Josh is saying, I think there, at a technical level, that seems to be true, which is an interesting switch because usually in traditional centralized systems, when you added cryptography, it made everything slower. And so you had to justify it versus here, because we're effectively removing data and a system that's overburdened, it makes it faster. But the social complexity of this bike shedding of which cryptography do we use, or hopefully you can use not complicated stuff, right? This whole debate of which which assumptions, which elliptic curves, right? Which, you know, do we believe in falsifiable assumptions? You, you've seen these things on Twitter, can slow things down. It's very practical from a socialist perspective to go, well, in the interest of scaling the debate and scaling the system, we're going to put those off for five years, and we're just going to ignore it. And uh, that is tempting, but if we do that, we will find out in five years that we can't add privacy to the system later, and it will be too late to fix it. Uh, there's a role for standardization here as well in dealing with the issue that Ian was talking about, um, that, uh, you know, the sort of fragmentation and the complexity. Uh, you've seen this in other areas as well, where those things that are similar across products um, uh, can be standardized while allowing people to still compete in the areas where there's more innovation. You saw that, you've seen that in cryptography, for example, right? There are standard ways to do many of the older uh, cryptographic primitives. It's understood how to do them, what key size you need, how you generate this or that. Even formats and so on are standardized, and that's all useful um, for a bunch of reasons. One. Uh, First, because it allows more vetting by the community of particular approaches, but also because it helps with the emergence of open source implementations. So you don't have people re-implementing the same stuff. So how do you think that interacts with what seems to be emerging now, where we have companies that are basically marketing, not a product, but literally they're like, you know, zero knowledge or encryption proof tech, and like trying to push these things. Are we going to is that going to disappear in like five years? Is that just a effect of the fact that this is a very nascent ecosystem? Or is this a problem of like, you're not going to standardize this because one guy says they want to standardize on thing A and someone's standardizing being completely different? Or did we have a start in cryptography and I was just too young and don't remember? <laughs> I mean, there's standardization works where there is enough agreement on where how some part of the system would work. Um, you know, you can come up with standards for, say, verification of zero-knowledge proofs, maybe, without needing to have a standard for how you generate the proof or what circuit, how you build the circuit that you're proving and so on. Um, so, um, you know, and similarly in other systems, there are parts that are standardized and uh, the standards can be pluggable, where people can plug in their own secret sauce in the areas where there is a lot of innovation and where it's a little bit less settled. 
I'm not an expert on the history of photography, but I do think that there was kind of similar things taking place with early encryption, right? Where it was in private companies and they selected some parameters and was like all dot magic. And over time, these things were battle tested, became established, were republished in a more open source way. So maybe we're just on track, but I do see what you're hinting at that this could be an issue. The reason I mention it is that it seems to me that that's exactly right. I mean, there were some standards for like DES and such, but a lot of it was all done by RSA for, for basic encryption and then uh, Netscape uh, for uh, PLS, or was SSL all the time. But it seems like in those cases there was one dominant like, guy who had all the expertise, and now in this case it's democratized, which is good, but there's now more infighting. Uh, and that somehow seems different, but that may be because I'm just sitting in the middle of it. I mean, if you look at cryptographic standards, some of the most popular standards, like the hash function standards, for example, or AES, were done through government-organized processes, although they were open competitions. Uh, and that was a way of organizing the community, and you had a lot of, it was community work. Um, and um, so lots of, um, Lots of diversity, different opinions about how to do that, but yet a strong standard emerged and one that, 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 that got trust out of that process. Uh, obviously, governments can run uh, these things badly, and the result of that can be, uh, uh, can be worse than nothing, um, as we all know. But, um, but there are good examples, good, uh, good existence proofs that this can be done well. Um, and you can get to standards even for things like uh, ciphers. Where there's a lot of um, a lot of different ideas about how to do it, and I guess standardization will help with making easier tools for privacy by design. So, um, yeah, is there anything else that you all want to say before we open up for questions? Okay, Does, are there any questions from the audience for the panel? Are we doing the mic thing or we're not? Yet? I have no idea. Okay. Oh, well. <laughs> there we go. It's fine, I can, uh, I can express. <laughs> uh, uh, could you talk about the role of cryptocurrency exchanges in this debate? And perhaps in your answers, could you either debate amongst yourselves or talk about, about what you'd like to see versus what you, you think will happen? So the question was how can exchanges help in the future yeah. of scaling the privacy? I'll start, which is going to be very brief, but with exchanges, my major concern is less exchanges, maybe for a bit, but mainly users and users' behavior, and it goes back to privacy and trust and like putting responsibilities on users as well, because if you look at statistics, how many people actually keep private keys themselves, and how many people trust exchanges with it, it's kind of boring to think, or I, I don't think we can think that these people will take responsibility for privacy. Yeah, I mean, if, if we all view data as, as a liability, then exchanges are effectively like, centralized exchanges are legally mandated nuclear waste stops. But like, they, they're where everyone's data goes, and, and they're legally required to, right? Like, and, and I don't see that changing. Um, to be honest. Um, so I, my preferred outcome that I don't think is actually likely, to be honest, is that, um, at least in, not anytime soon, uh, is that people figure out other ways to uh, exchange and get into these systems that do actually preserve privacy uh, without having to go through the, the nuclear waste dump. Any other questions? Who has the mic? Or I can just repeat. Should do without it, yeah. Uh, the question is, I guess, uh, in terms of the panelists, I guess, European and American, but probably like, the most users are or will be, and then mostly in Asia and China and Japan. And, uh, what is your experience from, from that side? Is there anything like we can see, okay, uh, uh, there's developments there, or, or what's your take on that? Uh, so, I, I, last month I was in Tokyo on a panel with some people from the JFSA, which is the Japanese Financial Services Administration, I believe, and they regulate uh, cryptocurrency and, and finance in Japan. And that was actually interesting because there was an appreciation of 
that privacy was a thing they should be aware of. Um, they wanted to deal with other things first, but that actually was a thing they were concerned about. They acknowledged that you need legitimately to have privacy for these things. Um, the really interesting thing there was that the regulatory environment, uh, JFSA is responsible both for consumer protection and privacy and for enforcing like anti-money laundering stuff. Versus in the US, the guys who do uh, money laundering is uh, Treasury Department FinCEN. And when you talk to them about privacy, they basically go, yeah, you sound right, but that's not our problem, so why are you getting in our way? So I think there may be some uh, better hope in, in parts of Asia. Um, in other places, uh, well, I'm not going to comment further on that. Anybody else? I mean, this also could be the difference between privacy for companies versus privacy for individuals, too. Oh, right. I mean, there is the other thing that, like, even in the most, like, privacy hostile uh, government you can think of, uh, those governments have enemies that are other governments, and they don't want those other governments seeing everything. Like, just imagine what would happen if you go look at everybody in, in, uh, who worked in the security service and get a company and go, oh, yeah, that guy there is having trouble paying his rent. Um, huh, maybe we can try to bribe him to give him all the, to give us all the classified documents he has, right? So there is an incentive, uh, even in, in regimes that are hostile to privacy, to at least have security from other governments they don't like. So it's kind of going to be funny to see how this dynamic plays out. Any other questions? Well, then I'm going to ask a fun question for the panel. <laughs> All right, so, um, so if you could, so we, I, I remember life before the internet. I, I, you probably do or have some idea of what life was like before the internet. And here we go again, Web3. What is, let's like maybe think about what would be your coolest dream for Web3 outcomes and what's life going to be like if, if everything works out as we want? Or some aspect of that, just think in the future. I thought you were going to go with the opposite. Like, what was it like back in the day before we like, you know, you're the person you go on a date with to find out everything you, everywhere you've been and everything you bought, just like Google <laughs> your address, right? It, it's tough poll, but I just hope that this could be like, like cloud computing infrastructure as powerful with better privacy, with less dependency, because as it turns out, information technology is like a key driver nowadays, and to have that access and solid infrastructure would be nice. On a more daily life level, I think there's still huge opportunities for integrating services, reducing vendor lock-in, all these kind of things that just make your daily life better, but we'll see how it's going to turn out over the next 10 years. My biggest hope is that we learn from what has happened before us. We had a chance kind of to, for a do-over, to uh, rebuild the technology stack that people rely on, and um, we have a real opportunity to do a better job. Uh, it is probably not as easy as we think to do that. The people who came before us faced a lot of trade-offs, they made a lot of decisions. Most of them still seem like good decisions in hindsight, and yet they ended up in a place that uh, has some real disadvantages. But I hope that we do better this time, and I think one of the keys to doing that is to, um, it, it, well, two keys to doing that are first to pay, really pay attention to what happened before and learn from it, uh, and two, not to give ourselves too much credit for being able to see ahead or for being more altruistic than we actually will turn out to be. Yeah, if, if I could describe like my ideal view for what the end result of this movement might be. Like, I actually, I think it'd be more, um, just in my, in my day to day, I would like to have a device on me that is not tracking me, that when I go to buy a book, it doesn't have DRM on it, I pay for it without having to enter in my email or user account and without anyone knowing who I am buying that, that information. Um, I just want to live in a world where it kind of emulates like what it was like when you went into a bookstore in it's 1970 cash. with cash, yeah. with cash. <laughs> and like, without a mobile phone in your with, pocket. And without a mobile phone in your pocket. Like, I actually feel like that's a return to form uh, and that we could build that return to form up gaining all the convenience that we, we have in today's society. So you're saying you want it to look like it? You're saying you want it to look like what it was before there was the internet? 
Yeah. yeah. But with the internet. <laughs> with the internet. Yeah. Yeah. So we want the mobile device in our pocket that's not acting like the mobile device tracking us in our pocket that we have right now. And we want something like cash, but that's digital. Right? Did I get that? Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other last comments? Yeah. We got six, 17 seconds. No, we're over time. <laughs> that's why it's counting up. Okay, well, <laughs> got anything else to say? All right, well, thank you, panelists, and thank you all for